And this is from the website Unsolved Appalachia. Robert Ray Honeycutt. Now this was posted just a little under a year ago, 2022. I actually had a close friend of Robert's reach out to me recently and we had an opportunity to discuss his disappearance. I'm, du I'm updating this entry to reflect the conversation I had with them um, as they had spent time with Robert the night before he went missing. I'm not mentioning any names here at their request. I wanted to start by saying I asked this person to tell me about Robert and he described him as being humble, funny, and smart. He's incredibly nice, but he had made some bad decisions in his life that ended up with him battling addiction. He had been struggling for over a decade, having entered rehab and managed to stay clean for a few years before falling back into his bad habit. On May the 4th, 2009, Robert Honeycutt, 31, had been at a friend's house. He had a phone call at around 9 p.m. that night with his parole officer. Robert didn't have a ride, so his friend made sure he was dropped off back at his house in Litcar, Kentucky, in time to take the phone call. After the call was over, Robert left with another friend whom he spent the night with. We'll call her the Mystery Lady. The following day, on May the 5th, he had a hearing in the Knock County Courthouse, and this is where the Mystery Lady dropped him off. At the courthouse, he managed to make friends with another woman. We'll call her a Courthouse Lady. He went home with her, but he had to be at his residence, which he shared with his parents, to take another call from his parole officer. Courthouse Lady allowed him to borrow her car to make the drive back home. After returning home, he spoke with his parole officer and seem, seemingly settled in for the night. He later received a call from the Courthouse Lady. She had become paranoid about the fact that she had let him borrow her car because it had no insurance. So she decided the, the best thing to do was to tell Robert if he didn't get it back to her that she would call the police and report the car stolen. Well, I'm sure that this put him in a panic because of, of him being on probation. Robert had regular phone calls with his parole officer, and he was doing his best to stay out of trouble. So I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume that his jail time was probably drug-related. And if he had been, if it had been reported that he had a stolen car, this was not going to go well for him. He left the house in a hurry to take the car back to the courthouse lady. But on the way, he wrecked over an embankment, landing in the creek off of Highway 160 between the Ivis Bible Church and Arby's Exxon gas station. A local business owner watched as a woman picked Robert up. He offered to call 911, but the offer was refused. The businessman wrote down the license plate number of the car that Robert got into. He called 911 and gave them the information. Law enforcement ran the license plate and the owner of the car told police that she had not seen the person that picked Robert up. The car's owner, along with her son, were both given and passed a polygraph test. The car was searched and there was no indication that Robert had been in the car. They believe the businessman may have written down the wrong license plate number. Later that night, a mystery, the mystery woman shows up at the residence Robert shared with his parents. Robert's father recalled that she was very upset and crying. At this time, Robert hadn't even been reported missing. The details of their conversation that happened that night are very fuzzy. But the person that I spoke with said Robert's father mentioned this about a year after his son's disappearance. Backpedaling here a little bit, 
Robert's uncle went to the location of the accident the day after Robert was reported missing and noted that there was a concerning amount of blood. To quote him, he said it looked like a hog had been slaughtered. So why did Mystery Woman show up at Robert's parents' house that night so upset? At that time, he wasn't even considered missing. It's like she knew something had happened to him, but she just didn't want to say. Maybe she went there to find out if the parents knew anything, what they would say. Could she have been the very last person to see Robert? If you think about it, he was taking the vehicle back to the person he was going to need a ride home. Could he have called her and asked her to give him a ride back home? I wonder if phone records were checked to see who he had called that day. I still think that whatever happened to Robert was ultimately an accident. I believe he had injuries that he succumbed to. Due to him having been involved in drug-related activities, and likely whoever he was with may have also been at that time, he was a male of white race, 31 years of age, at the time that he went missing, five foot six, a hundred and sixty pounds. He was wearing a yellow shirt and blue jeans. Um, he had blondish red hair and blue eyes. He has a tattoo of a panther on his right shoulder and a tattoo of a large eagle across his shoulder blades. Robert Honeycutt was last seen in Lit Car, Kentucky on May the fifth, two thousand nine. He left his home and en route he ran off of the road. The car went over a guardrail on Highway 160 and down an embankment. Witnesses saw Robert get out of the car and he was visibly injured. He ran to the main road and walked up a hill and got into another car. He was gone when the police arrived at the accident scene and he has never been seen again. Now, the reason that they're telling this this way is because the friend knew these people's names, knew who they were, but didn't want their names mentioned because they hadn't been charged with anything. They didn't want to be falsely accusing somebody of something, but they just wanted to make it known about these circumstances that occurred. Now, here is me giving my own thoughts on this. Later on that night, it is said, and I don't know who reported this. I don't know if he had said this to his parents. But it was reported that this lady called him up and said, I want my car back. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid because my car doesn't have any insurance on it. I think there's a little bit more to that. But after Robert spoke with his parole officer, he decided to settle in for the night. Now, that's the story that the friend tells. Now, was this friend in contact with Robert that night? Was he, were they texting? Were they talking on the phone? How did he know he decided to stay in that night? How did he know that this lady called him up and said, I need my car? So, my thoughts on this is that Robert got a phone call from this lady that they're calling courthouse lady, whose car he had. Now, either she loaned him her car and said, it's okay, take my car, go to your house, get the phone call from your pro officer, and then come back over, bring my car back. Or did he call her up and say, you know what, I've decided I'm not getting back out tonight, I'm going to keep your car until tomorrow morning and I'll bring it back to you. Then she got mad. Did she find out he was out driving her car around without her permission? You know, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just asking some questions. Because the biggest red flag for me in all of this was how did anybody know? Because his father told the police that he left to go to the store. Did he tell his dad, hey, I'm going to just run to the store? And did his family ask, whose car, are you, whose car are you driving? You know, whose car is this? Who, who loaned you their car? So she tells it that 
the, or the friend tells it that this lady told him, I'm going to call and report my car stolen. That, to me, says she's jealous. She found out he's with this other girl or this other mystery lady. She wants her car back. She's PO'd. I want my car back. I don't want you out with some other woman in my car or going to see some other woman. That's that's a possibility, or she didn't give him permission to keep her car. Maybe he said, I'm going to run over to my mom and dad, said I'm going to take this phone call, and I'm going to come straight back over to your house. And maybe he didn't, and she got mad about that. Or maybe she really did just want her car back because she was afraid he was out driving it with no insurance on it, and that, you know, but who who did he tell that to? That's my question. Because this so this friend is reporting this to this uh, unsolved Appalachia. But how did they know that? Was he in contact with them that night, saying to them, "This is what's happening." And well, it, it's it, what happened to Robert Honeycutt. In my own words, this is just me. Talking about this from the time that I read these different stories. He was a young man who had struggled with drug addiction in his life. And he had gotten into some trouble. But he was on probation. And he seemed to be, according to people, family and friends, he seemed to be trying. He was checking in with his pro officer. He was doing what was required of him. But he seemed to still be kind of mixing it up a little bit with some of the wrong people and this could have been what led to him getting into this accident and whatever happened to him after that now some theories are that he was so injured that night that he just died um, from these injuries they said that there was so much blood around the accident scene that his uncle said it looked like a hog had been slaughtered so could he have been very very injured and could could it be, despite the fact that he was on parole and despite the fact that he had spoken with his probation officer, parole, parole officer, just prior to this, that he could have been under the influence of something, some substance. And that is the reason why he... Um, Here's another theory that I have. The person in the car, while it doesn't say who they were, they were at the road when he came up, and it's like he knew that they were there. He knew to expect somebody to be there to pick him up. So could it be that before he even left his parents' home that night to take this other woman's car back to her, he had called this other woman, and said to her, you know, I'm going to need a ride home. Can you meet me there? Can you follow me? I'll meet you someplace. You follow me to drop this woman's car off and pick me back up. So she was behind him when the accident happened, and she picked him up, and maybe instead of going to the hospital because he was under the influence, maybe he wasn't thinking straight and just said, you know, take me to your house. And maybe he did just die from some accidental. Um, and why would this woman not report this to the police? Why would she not have just told the police this? You know? Why wouldn't she have just called the next morning if he passed away and said, you know, I picked this guy up last night. He refused to let me take him to the hospital. And I woke up this morning and he's passed away. I don't think she would have been in any trouble for that, um, other than maybe possibly, you know, helping him to leave the scene of an accident, but some people sometimes don't think clearly and rationally when they are under the influence and using drugs. I'm not saying that she was, but, you know... It's, it's stated that some of the people that he was known to associate with may have, this may have been the case, you know. Why would she not have just picked up the phone and called his parents and said, you know, he was in a really bad car accident and he doesn't want me to take him to the hospital, but I'm afraid he's not going to make it. He really needs medical care. 
you know. It seems that drugs may have been involved in this disappearance, given Robert's history and the circle of people that he associated with. I also find it suspicious that Mystery Woman would show up at his parents' house looking so upset before they ever knew that he was even missing. How is the woman who loaned him the car the mystery woman as they found the wrecked car and they must have had a VIN number available? It was definitely her car or it belonged to someone related to her as she said she would report it stolen. So was that, how, how do we even know that part of this story? Who did he tell this to? Did he call somebody up and was he calling several different people and saying hey man i gotta find a ride to take this lady's car back to her before she calls my parole officer or before she calls the cops and i end up back in jail and did some of his other friends say to him i can't give you a ride you know it's late at night it's really late i'm sorry i can't give you a ride and if he was really going to just deliver just take the car back i got to get this car back to this lady. I don't want any trouble. Why wouldn't he have asked his dad to just, Dad, follow me over here. I'm going to drop this car off and come straight back home with you. You know? So, how did anybody else even know that this was said? Unless this so-called mystery lady told this to somebody, told this to the police, or told this to another friend or one of his friends other friends had spoken to him that night how do we even know that part of the story you know so here is someone who lives in Knott County and they say I have been on this sub for years and have never found anything about lit car that's where I'm from here's some context for those of you who are not from eastern Kentucky Knott County is extremely rural the whole county is pretty unpopulated Appalachian Mountains it would not be entirely unplausible that an injured uh, former drug addict might try to hide in the woods to evade law enforcement and succumb to their injuries. Secondly, there is no such thing as the mystery lady in Knott County, Kentucky. The county has barely 15,000 people. This was written in 2019, so... Um, a car wreck on 160 would be big news. I find it unusual that neither the woman he borrowed the car from nor the woman in the green car are named. If the woman in the green car was interviewed by police, where does it say that she took Robert? Wouldn't her car have had his blood in it? There are so many details missing from this. Um, I doubt that, this, that either of these two women were mystery ladies to... The police, as as it was stated, he met one of these women at the courthouse. So, you know, it's possible that she was also there for some type of criminal charge. Or, you know, I'm not saying that she was, but it's possible. A Knott County man is still missing nearly three weeks after a car accident just a few miles from his home. Police say Robert Ray Honeycutt walked away from the accident and vanished. Family members say they have not heard from Robert Ray Honeycutt since May the 5th, the day of the accident. They say for Honeycutt to go this long with no contact, something must be wrong. This was written um, May the 26th of 2009. Glenn Honeycutt says his son Robert left his home in lit car on his way to the store. He says about 30 minutes later, I got a call saying that he had wrecked. So now did he tell his mom and dad, I'm going to run to the store? Did they ask, whose car is this? Whose car did you drive home? And why are you, you know, running to the store at whatever time of night it was? Or did the parents just say that because they didn't want to say, well, you know, he was taking this lady's car back to her because she was threatening to call the cops on him. And is it possible that he had taken her car without her permission and that she wasn't calling to report it stolen because um, 
it didn't have insurance on it, but simply because he refused to bring it back. You know, is that part of the story that we're not hearing about? It sounds to me like his family is speaking from the terms of this guy just ran out to the store, got in an accident. This guy, according to his family and friends, and I'm sure his pro officer knew this, that he checked in every night. His pro officer gave him a phone call every night, it seemed, at the same time. And so he was very diligent about making sure he was at home in time to take that phone call. So it would not be like him to go on the run and hide. Whatever the case, whatever the scenario that led up to that, He's not been seen since May of 2009. And while there are a lot of hills and hollers and back roads and uh, deep waters in and around Knott County, Kentucky, it would have taken time and it would have taken help for a woman to be able to dispose of this man's body and to get the blood and stuff out of her car seat you know, out of her car if he was bleeding and injured the way that witnesses said that he was. So I I kind of have a problem with them, with it being intentional. He could have been in a big hurry to try to get this lady's car back or to at least ditch it someplace before he got caught with it, that maybe he um, was just being careless and reckless and they said it was a pretty bad curve. So he could have just lost control of the car. I personally believe the reason the other woman was behind him and picked him up when the accident happened is because he had called her prior to this and told her, pick me up, I'm going to get rid of this car, I'm going to take it back, or I'm going to ditch it someplace. So she was following him to wherever it was that he was going. So she witnessed this accident and whatever happened at the time that he wrecked that car until the minute she shows up at his parents house crying and upset is still a mystery and the, the bigger mystery is whatever happened to him and why don't this woman just come clean you know she didn't murder him she didn't intentionally cause him bodily damage um, maybe she panicked and hid his body or someone else did and she knows about it and doesn't want to get them into trouble. But why does, I mean, both of his parents are gone now, they say, so maybe people are just not talking because they see no point. Now that his parents are no longer here, they probably figure, you know, if nobody's investigating me, I'm going to keep quiet. But... This case may never be solved unless remains are found, and they're probably not really looking, I mean, to be honest. The update that I could find was that both of his parents passed away, his mother in 2012 and his dad in 2014. He is listed as preceding them in death. So that means that he was declared dead, this is the reason why you couldn't find anything on him about um, on missing persons sites. Because they're not looking for him because he's been declared dead. But people, uh, somebody being declared dead doesn't necessarily mean they are dead. And if he is dead, where are his remains? I've said this, and for anyone who hears me that is from Eastern Kentucky or any of this area here, you know what I'm talking about. And for those who don't, you can probably imagine just from pictures, but Eastern Kentucky mountains are vast, and there are many back roads and hollers and trails and Lots of places where somebody could take a body. But with the creation and the... Well, this has been going on for years, people go. 
hiking and exploring on these back roads and back trails and stuff. But in the last, I would say, 10, 15 years, these side-by-sides and four-wheeler riders have created new trails. They've cut new roadways and trails through these hills in places where people probably hadn't been in years. Um, I remember going side-by-side -side riding a couple of years ago in a place that is kind of on the border of Kentucky and Virginia. And one of the people in our group got stuck in this deep rut and we were having to all stand around while the other guys were trying to pull him out. And I remember my friend and I were standing on the roadway and you could look down over the roadway and it just dropped. And it, there was like a creek down there, but it was nothing but like just pine trees and rocks. And I said, I wonder how far of a drop it was from where we were standing all the way to the bottom. And I remember we were joking about it, and I said, if somebody wanted to hide a body, nobody would ever find it back in here because people pass through there. They're, they're on these side sides, and they just there's nothing around, so they just keep on going, you know. I don't. Be, I, I personally want to say I don't believe, and I could be wrong. I don't believe that anybody directly caused his death. I think that whatever happened to him happened as a result of the car accident. And the woman who he was with, whose car he got into, should have just come clean with the police. But I don't know what she told to the police. I, di I, didn't, I couldn't find anything on that about her story. If she said to them, yes, I picked him up. Yes, I know there were witnesses that saw me picking him up. And after that, he, you know, that's where it goes cold. I couldn't find anything about what she may have said to the police. But she did come to his parents' house that night distraught. And um, the after they found out that he'd been in the accident and everything, they just said they couldn't um, understand why she came to the house that night and didn't say to them, you know, I come here to let you know that he died. Or, you know, maybe she went there on a fact-finding mission because maybe he did just take off from her. Maybe he thought the police were going to come searching for him. And maybe he did run off into the hills or somewhere to hide out and just succumb to his injuries from this. Um, it was May. I don't know what the weather was like that night. I don't know how cold it got that night. But he couldn't have gotten far. Did they do a foot search of the hills around the area to see if maybe they could find remains? Um unless someone picked him up and gave him a ride in a car and took him a great distance away, I can't imagine that he could have gotten very far on foot. So my personal theory, and I could be way off wrong here, but just thinking about it, I think it's very possible that he passed away from these injuries. They were afraid that maybe they were going to get in trouble because they didn't take him to the hospital. Maybe they had drugs on them, or maybe they were under the influence, or maybe they were afraid that they might be accountable in some way. And maybe they disposed of his remains to keep from themselves getting in trouble. I don't know. Here, here's an answer to my own question. For about two weeks after Robert went missing, law enforcement brought out cadaver dogs. They searched a two-mile radius from the location where he had wrecked, but they had no luck. So now cadaver dogs are dogs that search for the scent of someone having died. Did they bring in just regular search dogs that would have been looking for a live person? And this is one of the theories that I had as to why they never found him, 
because they did only bring in cadaver dogs and search for two miles. Had they brought in live uh, dogs that were, were searching for a live person, maybe if they had searched for four miles or six miles or ten miles, they might have picked up his scent. See, that's part of what I don't understand is why they searched, why they brought in cadaver dogs. Because it doesn't say anything about search dogs. So did this woman tell them that he died? Did this woman tell them he was dying? And here's a little bit of advice for anybody out there. And I know I, I'm not a law enforcement person and I'm not. But I will just say this. The little bit of minimal of trouble that this woman might have been in, which I don't know what it could have been other than maybe possibly aiding someone fleeing the scene of an accident. I don't think she would have been in any major trouble. Call 911, people. If somebody's in your car and they're dying and they're hurt and they're injured and they're bleeding... No matter what the circumstances might be, if you have not, if you did not participate in their injuries, if you didn't cause the accident, if you didn't take part in anything illegal, then why not pick up the phone and call the, you know, the police or 911 and say, this person's injured. I believe they're going to pass away. Please come and get them, you know. But anyway, I appreciate y'all for listening, and I believe that this case is pretty much a co Well, the man's been declared legally dead, so I think this case has been closed in the eyes of law enforcement. In the eyes of the public and these channels and these web pages, it's still a mystery as to what whatever happened to him. People in in Knott County, people in Litcar and Hindman and around the area where this took place, they knew who she was. People knew, and they probably asked her questions. If she's still around there and she's still living, they probably do still ask her questions. I would encourage her to just come clean, you know, and just tell what you know. So people can... People like myself and others can say, okay, there's your answer. But in the event that anyone should have any information about this, please contact the Kentucky State Police at 606-435-6069. Thank you.